Hello, welcome beautiful people. On my journey, I've had lots of experiences along the way. And everything I've done, at the time I didn't understand. Sometimes I thought it was the end of the world. Times when I'm thinking, why me? I'm thinking, how can I get so much shit happen to me in one lifetime? Why am I in this place? Why have I gone down this path? And as I got older, I've realised everything that has happened to me in my life has led me to where I am now. All the bad, all the negative, all the good, all the fun times, everything. I don't really like this saying, but everything happens for a reason. But there is a greater purpose than us. We don't understand it while we're here because we're in a subjective role. We can't look at the big picture when we're caught in the picture. But as I've developed and got older, not so much older, I've, I've developed a little bit more insight and perspective and I can look back over my life and I can understand and I can see why those things happened. They all kind of fit in and they've turned me into the person I am today, to what you see here. And to many people, I've been a lot of many different things. To some people, I've been a criminal. To some people, I've been like a scary kind of person, which I'm not. Um, to other people, I've been like a soft pussy kind of person. I'm none of those things. I am just me. I like to think of myself as a caring, empathetic person who makes mistakes. And now I'm going to reflect over some of my life. And go through it and hoping it can help someone out there. Someone like you. Because we all we all suffer in our life. In one way or another. We may look at someone and think they've had a blessed life. But trust me, these people have suffered too. And they're just better at hiding it. Better at coping. Or they don't know how to deal with it. So they've pushed it to the back and repressed it. So to help me with my... Able to show you my path I'm going to have to go back to some of my back to my early childhood I'll I'll tell stories from different times of my life they won't be they'll be in no chronological order as I post them they'll be as I come to as they come to mind but I can sit back now and look at everything and see how it all matches in how it's all been there to get me to this point in my life so what I'm going to talk about tonight is my childhood. Even before my childhood, I'm going to talk about adoption, being adopted, how I felt about that. I'm going to talk about after my adoption, my childhood and losing a parent when I was at a young age, six, the breakdown of the nuclear family after that, then displacement, going through getting sent to orphanages and stuff every time my mother went to hospital. I'll talk about that with my brother and sister. Through to my teenage years, through refuges, being incarcerated, and eventually to my later teenage years when I, I lost my brother. It all started for me, my journey, before I was born, when my natural mother fell pregnant at the age of 16. Even before I come along, it had been decided that I was going to be given up. She actually gave birth to me when she was 17. It was, the year was 1969. And in 1969, single mothers, they were looked down upon. Many of those mothers, whether they liked or not, were forced to give up their kids. Not by their choice, through pressure from the family, the community, and there's a lot of people my age, probably probably to the born from through the 60s, 70s, not so much the 80s, that have been that were adopted. Adoption was a big thing back in my day, and being an adopted child, you're either to, you're either told when you're very young, or you're not told at all. You don't know, but inside you know there's something not. There's something that's not quite sitting right with you. You know, you've got a sense of not belonging, a sense of disconnection, a sense that you're different, a sense that something's not right. 
But my early years from the age of my birth, from the age of my birth, through to six years old, I was, I was adopted into a good family. I had a father, who was a hard worker, had a good job, had my mother, who was a proverbial good housewife with the apron and baking on a Sunday and looking after the kids. They adopted a, a sister for me, and then they gave birth to their own child afterwards. So there was three of us, and I, myself being the eldest. Everything was grand until my father died at six. He had cancer, and he was a great man. My life from the age of zero to six was picture perfect. I had a loving family, a loving father. He used to get out in the out in the front yard with me, I remember, and kick a football around with me, a soccer ball. When he could hardly drag himself out of bed, he was dying. He was 32 when he died. He went over the edge. He, it was such a hard thing for him. But when when he died, our family fell apart. That was the end of it. My mother, she was never the same. She switched off emotionally. She shut down. She was sick a lot. Um, when she went to hospital, she she didn't want to reach out to relatives or anything because she felt ashamed that she was a single mum, even though she lost her husband. So well, my brother and my sister and myself were sent off to... Um, well, orphanages while she was in hospital, sometimes two, three weeks at a time, four weeks. Um, but because I was older, I was separated from them. So I, I used to go down to a place in um, called Eleanor McKinnon in Cronulla, a Red Cross home, um, and stay down there. And my brother and sister, they went off to uh, an orphanage at Ranwick somewhere in Sydney. Um, and other times they got fostered out to different families and I went back to that Red Cross home. I, I went there a couple of times. And so as a child being separated from your family, from your mother, losing your father, your brother and sister, you get what's called separation anxiety, detachment syndrome. And you're too, you're too young, you feel alone, you feel scared that... The horror, the terror that you go through. Even though there's, um, we're in like places that kind of made it like adventures. That down Tranella, they took us to the beach on outings. We played cricket with the other kids in there and kept score. And it was it's kind of fun activities. You never, you're always missing your home. You're missing your family. You're, you're missing your brother and sister. I, I worried constantly about my brother and sister, um, being the older brother. And then we go back home again, and then, think, honestly. My mother was emotionally cold. There was no affection, no real love. I mean, she did love us, but she was very... She couldn't show it. Um, I'm not disrespecting my mother when I'm talking about it because she, under the circumstances, she went through a living hell. She had three kids, two that was adopted, and she lost her husband. So she had to go work. And us kids were... Basically, had to get ourselves off to school, get ourselves back from school, fed, whatever, until she came home, and it kind of worked. But it was um, it wasn't really, it wasn't really a loving environment. Us kids used to fight a lot amongst ourselves. So, no, we 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 did get along, but amongst all that, at the age of just after a. Around the time my father died, I was told I was adopted as well. And at that young age, I I really couldn't process it. But I started to slowly understand. It was never it was never a secret from me. And as a child, my mother had a lot of anger, and and she, I remember when I was about six or seven, she used to call me by my birth name. She'd say, stop that, Anthony. And i go, who's Anthony, Mum? And she'd go, it's you. That's your name, Anthony Ryan. And I'm like, who's Anthony Ryan? She goes, it's you. You're not a Brooks. And she used to make me feel excluded from the family. This is where I got my separation anxiety from. This is where I got my detachment sy syndrome from. This is where I lost my trust. I, I lost my sense of family and stuff. I felt excluded. And I basically rebelled. And going into my teenage years, I ended up going into youth refuges. 
uh, places, homeless shelters and stuff like that. I was out on the streets. I was actually in New South Wales. I was charged with a charge called an uncontrollable child. It was a social welfare complaint. It doesn't exist anymore. Instead of the parents being punished back in those days, the Department of Community Services, DOCS, they used to punish the children. And I got dragged off and taken away and put in a, a children's home or a, a juvenile detention centre because I was deemed an uncontrollable child. And all this time I knew I was adopted and stuff. And I, I remember when I was... 16 or 17, I was in an, another youth refuge. I kind of snuck out for the night and I got drunk in Newcastle and I'm walking home. I was in a, I was in a suburb called Carrington and um, it's quite a, it's on the walls, quite a rough, kind of real working class place where all the wharfies and sailors and ship over, there's about, there's <laughs> literally like 10 or 15 pubs in this little suburb, which is about two square kilometres. And, um, I remember walking from Newcastle and walking across the footy field there in Carrington and I started crying. I was drunk and young. <laughs> I did, I started crying because I did not know who the fuck I was. Who am I? I kept asking myself, who am I? I'm not a Brooks. I've got no family. I'm not wanted. I'm, I'm nobody. And I broke down crying. And I've gone back to the place I was staying in. I've snuck in and climbed in be into bed. And I've cried myself to sleep. And when I woke up in the morning, one of the, the house managers or whatever the, they were said, there's um, some mail here for you. And I've opened it up. There's a letter. And it was from a place called Adoption Triangle. And they said, we've, relocate we've located your birth mum. And I got all excited. So they had a number in there and I asked the office if I could use their phone. I rang them up and they looked at me, yeah, we have, but we weren't meant to tell you. That letter wasn't meant to go out to you till you were 18, because I was under 18. And I said, I felt an instant letdown. They said, no, but since we've told you it's only right, we can't do it, we will arrange a meeting. So I met my natural mum at the age of, um, I think I was 17. And it was kind of, it was a real weird, when I met it, it was really weird. We had social workers, there was chaplains, and it was set up in a, in like a, um, a place called Centre Care, which was, um, they owned the homes that I was staying in. And they made this meeting, and I remember the first meeting, my mum and I, we both sat there and bullshit each other. We... I told her I was a good boy and she said she was a good girl and this and that. And I'm talking about all my academic success and well, my past life. <laughs> and um, she's telling me how she's um, a good, a good, la uh, anyway, we, we bullshitted each other. And then curiosity got the better of me about a week or two after the meeting. And I've kind of jumped on the train and took off and saw her down Sydney and we ended up partying together, <laughs> getting on it. We were the same kind of people. We were. We, we were both the same kind of people. And then I met my cousins down there. And, they, and then eventually through all that, I met my natural brother and sisters, who I'm still great friends with these day, with these, with to this day. And all my cousins. Because I met my natural family when I was so young. They've been with me all my life. And I've been with them all their life. So, so to my younger siblings and to my younger cousins and everything, they haven't known any different. This, these are the ones in my um, natural family. But with all that, it made me feel pretty well fucked up because I felt disloyal to my um, brother and sister, my natural brother and sister. I mean, my my ones I grew up with and to my mum. And with my natural mum, I never ever called her mum. I used to say things like Happy Mother's Day, but I just called her Sue. And I couldn't, it was hard for me to call her mum because I was, even though my other mum, my birth mum, who's my mum, my birth mum, sorry, my mum who brought me up, even though she was emotionally cold, she was still my mum. She changed my nappy, she put food on the table, she fed me, she clothed me. And even though the house, I would say it was very emotionally abusive. It was very... She wasn't... Well, she actually, she was physically abusive too, but I'm not here to run her um, 
name for the dirt because back in those days, kids got the strap, kids got the cane, kids got the jug cord. I, I copped that, but I, when I copped it, I really copped it. I had welts and I was bleeding, but it's not about that. That's just that was part of my growing up, and um, she was still my mum, so I felt caught between two worlds, and I always felt guilty spending time with my natural family who I just found. It was all exciting, and during that time, my brother I grew up with, he was going through a hard time. He was going, he was kind of going down the same path as me, and ended up in refuges and stuff, and. He didn't make it. He ended up. He ended up. It's either accidentally overdosing through misadventure or suicide. It's more suicide in my eyes. And um, there's a lot of um, grey areas and what actually happened. But that was hard on me because I did try to include him, and he come down and met my natural brothers and sisters, and I was trying to, I guess I was caught up in what was going on in my life and I kind of felt guilty. And I, I felt, I, if I was there for him, it might not have happened, but you can't think like that. As I've realised now, what's happened's happened. It was a very hard and trying time in my life, very hard and trying. So, I know what it's like to have lost family. I know what it's like to be torn between two families. I know what it's like to grow up in, like, missing your family, in, like, to be in an orphanage. I know the fear. I know this. I know what it's like to fall asleep crying. I know what it's like to be scared. I know what it's like to live on the streets. I know what it's like to go to refuges. I know what I know what I've seen the worst in life that you can possibly see. I've seen people, young people, die on the streets. I've seen them lose themselves. I've seen them lose themselves in drugs. I've seen young girls my age die while working the streets on the needle, prostituting themselves out at King's Cross. And they were all fucking beautiful souls they were all forgotten they were all pushed under by the system the same system that's here today it wasn't today this today the system's not perfect back then the system wasn't perfect the system will never be perfect that's why it's important that we start to be accountable and responsible for ourselves that we invest interest in self we invest time and love into ourselves we learn how to pick ourselves up we learn how to pick our friends up we learn how to pick our families up we learn empathy we learn compassion we learn love and we learn how to think we learn how to think of others and not just ourselves as i said the system's not perfect the system it will not help people the system will do you know what? It'll do the bare minimum it needs to do to keep politicians being re-elected, the bureaucrats to make it look like they're doing something because they really don't care. They're there about finances, getting re-elected, about the budget, about the media, and what will they think. You know, we've got to be here for each other. So this is just one part of my life. There's where things have... I've gone through hardship. I questioned the pain. I, I can still feel, I can still remember that pain, that feeling of despair, that feeling of being unwanted, the feeling of helplessness. Though I, I wouldn't say I really felt worthless. I might have felt like that in the moment, but I haven't really felt worthless because I've always known inside me there is a purpose, uh, there is a there is a bigger picture, and I've always I've always had confidence in my ability to get my way through things and events, to not be lost, to not to succumb to unaliving myself. Okay, to I've felt like that many times. I felt like that many times, and I won't lie, when I was younger. 
I did have a few failed attempts and um, there was other plans for me. There was other plans. I managed to walk all paths of my life. All paths of my life have led to where I am now. And that's so I can reach out to people who can't see past today, who can't see past their troubles, who can't see past the darkness, to give them a bit of, bit of hope. Look at me. I have come past that darkness. And as I've said in other videos, I'm not where I want to be yet, but I'm still here. And every single day, my life is getting better. My purpose has been fulfilled. I have something to live for. I'm not living for my past. I'm living for my today and my future. And I'm living so I can help someone get through this time now where they're struggling. Which one day will be their past if they stay focused. If they stay focused on the big picture. And the big picture is life is a journey. Every little bit of hardship, every struggle, every pain, every bit of tear is for us. It's for us, for our betterment. It's for us to be stronger and wiser because way past this lifetime, there is a bigger purpose for it, for us. This is only the beginning of our journey. Spiritually, we're growing. Spiritually, we're awakening. Spiritually, we are evolving. Just hang in there. Never give up. Because that child that I was, that frightened, scared little child, I, I got through it. And here I am. God bless you all. And stay positive.